I'd like to point out that of the 16 or 17 speakers today, there's only one from Waterloo, and that's me. Uh, what we're trying to do is create a community across Canada, four different provinces here, by the way, uh, at the front table. Businesses here, all the way from uh, the, the left coast to uh, Quebec. So we're trying to create a community to move forward in this area. So enough about politics. I would like to talk about the potential of geothermal energy storage. But I also want to say that new technologies are never commercial when they are first thought about. The only time you get to commercialization is when the technology has been understood, perfected, and developed. We're early on in the process in geothermal energy in Canada. One of the reasons for that is that energy is very cheap compared to other countries, so there has been less of an incentive to move forward. So, energy storage is going to be a key for the future. And everybody talks about batteries, including Elon Musk, and he's very convincing, but batteries have cost, space, and huge, huge environmental impacts that are simply not even mentioned in the enthusiasm to adopt batteries. But we still need long-term, large-scale storage, and the three options uh, seem to be uh, pumped hydro, compressed air energy storage, and maybe, maybe a little bit of that might be geothermal heat storage. So I want to speak about the potential of geothermal, geothermal heat storage, at least from a conceptual point of view. Uh, in the future, our energy will come from more and more from renewables, and these renewables are already creating strains on our somewhat old grids because the renewables are intermittent, irregular. Uh, you cannot predict that they will be available six weeks from now in the quantities that you wish to have them. Therefore, storage becomes absolutely essential to the factoring in of wind power, solar power, tidal power, and other uh, types of renewable energy. So one approach is pumped hydro, and the largest pumped hydro project in North America, I believe, is Sir Adam Beck. But we're not going to go and flood huge amounts of valleys all around southern parts of Canada to store uh, pumped hydro. Another option is compressed air energy storage at Waterloo. And I'm going to show you this diagram a little bit later again. So keep in mind that this diagram is going to be different than the one I'm going to show you a little bit later, but similar. So the issue here is heat storage. So you can see the little blinking light there that says heat storage. In order to make compressed air energy storage really energetically favorable, we have to find a way of using the heat of compression or of storing it to reheat the air when it comes out of the cavern. Because when we expand the air through an air expander, it gets very cold. It gets very cold. So you actually have to heat the air in order to get the power out of it. Okay? So heat storage turns out to be interesting in the context of compressed air energy storage. And by the way, the first compressed air energy storage demonstration project is underway in Goderich. The company is seeking the permits, and hopefully about a year from now, it'll be close to uh, commissioning. So uh, these large-scale energy storage systems are available, but not everywhere in Canada. For example, hydro storage and compressed air energy systems in the Canadian north, mm, not so much. Furthermore, renewable energy sources like solar and wind, well, talk to the people in Nikaluit who will tell you that the sun doesn't shine for quite a few days, and when the sun doesn't shine, the wind doesn't blow. So we have to look at other options. You just can't sit here and say, oh, yeah, well, we're just going to do renewable power in the north. Whoa! You know, they have needs there that are different than our needs for geographical and climatic reasons. So we have to look at other options. And one of them is using a geothermal system to store heat on a seasonal basis. That has been talked about, and we already do shallow geothermal, which store heat in a small scale, relatively shallow, um, partially seasonally, okay, with losses. So a geothermal system that I'm speaking of is not 50 or 100 meters deep. We're talking about a geothermal system that is kilometers deep. If we can develop the technology to uh, develop a large geothermal system four or five kilometers deep, 
We can extract the heat from the earth, but we also maybe in the future with the right technology be able to store heat on a seasonal basis. And if you think that drilling down five or six kilometers to get uh, this, what we call intermediate grade uh, geothermal heat, if you think that's impossible, well, in Finland, the, the project is already down 4.6 kilometers uh, and they have a target depth of seven kilometers. And like the gentleman from Finland said to me on the phone, he says, you know, Maurice, he says, we're doing the world a favor because we chose the absolute worst site in all of Finland for the geothermal energy. So if we can solve that problem, he says, anybody can do it in the world. So that's kind of cute. So uh, we can kind of conceive of a geothermal north project uh, trying to displace the heavily, heavily subsidized diesel fuel in the north with other forms of power and power storage and maybe, uh, maybe uh, geothermal. So there are issues. Uh, drilling costs, well stimulation costs, and these are the research issues that we wish to address. So over here on my left is, uh, is uh, Steve, uh, who uh, basically sat there with uh, colored pencils and colored this map very carefully for NRCAN when he did all the work. And uh, much of Canada looks pretty blue, which means it's not high grade heat like in potential in British Columbia and the Yukon. Uh, there's a little bit of hot potential up in Ellesmere Island in the northern part of Canada, but it's not well defined yet. So we're looking at an intermediate grade energy uh, for, uh, for this kind of uh, energy source. Okay? And many of our uh, deep igneous rock or masses are in fractured rocks, and those fractures turn out to have a very important role in carrying the heat into the rock or carrying the heat out of the rock. And that's part of the research, for example, that Ra Rob Gracie is doing, is how to stimulate and create an interconnected fracture network to access this heat. Uh, and uh, that is pretty cutting edge uh, technology, actually. So I'm, I, the big issues right here are cost of drilling, how do we handle the fluids at depth which have uh, uh, scale problems, and we can't dispose of them just by putting them in a river. Uh, and we have to have access to a large enough volume at depth that requires a couple of drill holes, and uh, probably 20 megawatts uh, for a, uh, something like this is probably uh, the kind of scale that you want. So 20 megawatts starts to be uh, you know, a community of several thousand people, or maybe a, you know, a big mining company with a community, that, that type of scale. But of course, the advantages are that it's steady, reliable, and uh, self-powered. So here's the EGS concept, uh, you know, put uh, uh, cold water down, get hot liquid up. Uh, if you want to do heat storage or geothermal, you're looking at a volume of on the order of a half a cubic kilometer, maybe a quarter of a cubic kilometer. That sounds like a lot, but it's actually not that much with uh, the wells. This is the Finland project. Uh, that's their conceptual diagram going down seven kilometers uh, near the city of Helsinki in a city called Espo. And that's the drilling rig in the background there, one of the world's largest uh, drilling rigs capable of doing hammer drilling at depths of five, six, seven kilometers, which is exceptional. And just for, uh, that's, that's where it's located, the project right there. And they're actually looking at 40 megawatts in granite. So these solutions are being developed. And of course, to get the power out uh, as partly electricity, partly heat, and that's an advantage we have in Canada. Is we need the heat. If you're trying to do this kind of system in Southern California, they don't need the heat. So that means that essentially they are more handcuffed than we are, because all they need is electrical power. We can actually do electrical power and use the heat beneficially for homes and industrial heating and other reasons. So let me just jump to the, uh, to the uh, concept uh, of heat storage. Heat storage basically means operating the enhanced geothermal system in reverse when you don't need as much uh, energy and you have another source of energy like solar power. So here I have the geothermal repository on your left. Parabolic reflectors collecting solar energy on the right. And I point out to you that a solar collector that is collecting heat on an area basis is five times more efficient than a solar collector that is collecting photovoltaic electricity five times more efficient. So we normally think of energy in terms of 
well, let's see, gravity, water, electricity, and then heating our home. Well, here we're talking about heat, heating water, being stored as heat, stored as heat and heating our homes. So we're not converting the, power, the, the energy to different systems. We're collecting heat, storing it, and using heat. Now, some of that heat that we use might be converted to power, but the rest of it is, um, is useful for space heating. So here's my diagram again for compressed air energy storage. Now I've added the concept of geostorage of heat to make the whole compressed air energy system much more efficient. If we can solve this problem, our geostorage in this case is not seasonal, like five months or six months. It's actually only daily or a few days of storage. So that's much, much more tractable problem to solve. So we, if, we can store, if we can solve this problem, then we can extrapolate to larger storage. Monitoring is necessary in order to understand what the heck we're doing. Uh, I'm in geomechanics, and we have to have deformation monitoring. And this is just a map of deformation monitoring on another kind of a thermal process, uh, steam-assisted gravity drainage in, in Alberta, where we take very careful measurements, and, uh, and we, that allows us to calibrate our models and make them much, much stronger. And of course, micro-seismics, if we're going to be uh, cooling a region or heating a region uh, here, we're going to generate stress changes, and that's going to create some seismicity. Understanding that induced seismicity, which is very small in general, uh, allows us uh, insight into the process at depth. So that's the concept uh, that I hope to uh, help move forward is the seasonal storage of heat. Uh, I'm not sure what to call it, geostore or something like that. Uh, but that sounds like a, a marketing name, you know, for uh, camping equipment or something. So, uh, but, but we'll find a nice good name for it, I'm sure. And uh, is it new technology? Yeah, it is. Uh, is it something that has been tried on a seasonal basis uh, in a large scale around the world? No, it hasn't. Do we need the heat? Yes, we do. So, you know, we have to make sure that we don't uh, just ignore uh, ideas because they're new. And my last proposal that was sent to NSERC was turned down by a fellow who said, this idea is not likely to be commercial. If you apply that, idea, that, that comment to all of the research proposals in Canada, then we academics would actually go back to farming because we wouldn't be able to do any research. Okay? So am I saying that this is commercial? No, but I think there's a pathway to making this commercial on a national scale. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Pune Magul from the University of Manitoba. And I am thank you so much for inviting me. It's a big, actually, pleasure, a great pleasure for me to be here. Then I'm going to talk about the applications of thermal piles and energy efficiency of buildings or basements and what's the relationship. I'm going to talk about that. Okay, then um, Dr. Morris talked about these deep uh, thermal piles. I'm more interested in shallow applications and use it for actually heating and cooling or HVAC system in buildings, residential buildings. And the goal is to integrate these heat exchanger inside the structure uh, foundation. It means that we have a deep foundation and as a geotechnical engineer, we try to find a good place to put our foundation to have enough support for our building for that structural loads. But the goal is to integrate this heat exchanger inside the concrete. Uh, but if we want to develop it, we have to ask many questions. The first thing is what's the heating and cooling energy demand and loads for buildings? Is it possible to, you, to, to use the same energy demand in Montreal, in Ottawa, in Winnipeg, Regina? For sure, no, because we have different climate conditions. We have different uh, snowfalls. Then for sure, we need to do a study and uh, obtain this energy uh, demand and loads for buildings. The other question that we need to ask is what's the effect of the ground thermal mass on the energy performance of buildings? 
As you can imagine, this energy demand is related to mechanical engineering, and for these nice people, soil or mm, ground is take it easy, then they try to consider a very easy approach uh, to model the effect of a ground thermal mass on their calculation, unfortunately. And the other question, which is somehow related to uh, this energy demand calculation, is the effect of freezing and thawing cycles, and even energy balance at the ground surface mean uh, around the building on this uh, energy performance of building. The other question that we need to ask is what's the thermohydromechanical behavior of these thermal piles beneath the building? Because if our foundation doesn't work properly, for sure we cannot use our building anymore properly. Then that's actually a big question to, um, to think about what's the thermohydromechanical behavior of these thermal pipes for shallow application. And the, the last one, or most challenging, is what's the results of an excessive heat extraction from the thermal pipe? Canada, we have cold weather. We are more interested in using thermal pile during winter to heat our houses. Then sometimes it can cause uh, problems because of this excessive heat extraction, and we don't think to return that energy to, to the ground. That's why it becomes uh, essential to develop a thermohydromechanical modeling for soil, for ground, for different scenario by considering different actually approach. The, 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 the first thing is uh, for saturated and unsaturated conditions in soil. Then during summer, during winter, then it can, it can change. The other thing is the consideration of freezing, thawing, or seasonal frost, and at the end, the energy balance at the ground surface. Then we need to develop a simulation tool. We need to develop, uh, to build actually uh, our knowledge by answering these different questions. Just for your information, NRC reported that, as you can see, more than 65% of, uh, of energy use uh, is for space heating and cooling. Then I think uh, it's that much, so much. Then the problem is that foundation heat losses can no longer be considered a less important part in the total building heat loss. And again, according to NRC, foundation heat losses can count for 20 to 35% of a home's heat loss, then we cannot ignore it anymore. Then uh, to reduce this uh, heating energy demand, we need to consider the effect of the ground thermal mass on the energy performance of building. And the other thing which, which is very challenging is that thermal properties of soil change during the year. During summer, winter, spring, we cannot consider a constant thermal or hydraulic properties for our soil in uh, geothermal applications. And the thermal properties, again, uh, depend mainly on the temperature, water content, and phase change. I initiated this project in collaboration with uh, Institut de Recherche de Hydro-Québec in, uh, in Quebec, and they built actually twin houses, uh, and they gathered uh, for more than two years, uh, each 15 minutes, uh, the data that we needed to calculate this uh, heat loss. Then the objective was, of my work was to develop a tool for them uh, to actually study the effect of freezing and thawing uh, for unsaturated soil conditions uh, for actually heat loss calculation in buildings. Soil is considered as a multi-phase porous media. It means that we have solid skeleton, we have voids actually filled with water and air. And if we apply this thermal gradient, uh, water can be actually in two uh, states. It can be vapor or even it can be ice. Then we need to develop a tool to actually model this thermal gradient, this uh, uh, complex, sophisticated phenomenon in soils by taking some 
assumptions. Uh, and we need to develop actually or constitutive laws for each parameter uh, of soil. Here actually we introduced total water content including uh, liquid and, uh, and ice. And the other thing by some thermodynamics equation, we developed uh, equation for liquid water content and ice content. The other thing which is very interesting is, that is actually um, the um, freezing point in soil because of this interfacial forces between solid grains and water and air, freezing point is lower than zero degree. And it's something that we need to consider in, in our calculation. Then we develop some thermodynamics. I know that you are not maybe interested in, then I skip uh, of this uh, part, just to show you the, the mathematics behind this, uh, this model. Then uh, the challenge that we have uh, in this numerical modeling is that our system is highly nonlinear and we need to actually um, consider some uh, linearization to, uh, to, to, to um, actually obtain good results. Then once I validated this model, I apply it to study the heat loss through the basement. Then here you can see actually um, and unsulated uh, basement, the boundary conditions that we apply. Then in this application, I assume that water uh, table is 10 meters below the, the surface. I know that maybe in Canada it's not very realistic, but I want to present it as a case study and show that uh, mean it's really important to study the thermohydraulic um, effect in soil. Then here you can see the distribution of temperature uh, around the non-insulated basement. Uh, and you can see that even during uh, spring, we can have uh, ice in the ground that can affect actually the, the heat loss through uh, the basement. And you can see even that the heat loss that we can have uh, through, um, uh, through uh, slabs or wall, we have mainly this heat loss through the wall, a basement wall, which can be six times more than heat loss that we can have um, uh, through the uh, slab. And uh, this case means putting water uh, table at 10 meters below the ground surface, it's not the worst scenario. The worst scenario is uh, when um, soil is completely saturated. Then you can see that even by considering 10 meters below the ground surface, it can have uh, up to 7% of change in uh, heat loss. Then maybe for in this case, you can say that it's not that much important, but when you put the ground table at, I mean, uh, water table at the ground, this can be uh, very huge. Now I try to apply this model to study different actually application using uh, thermal piles. Uh, now I have an uh, ongoing uh, project uh, for snow melting and de-icing of bridge decks and pavement using thermal piles. We are trying to study the feasibility of this technology uh, for different cities in Canada and provide actually an optimum design for that. The other thing is thermohydromechanical modeling of energy geostructures this time in cold region, in freezing soils, and it can be very interesting in warm permafrost zone, and we are not actually very sure about, uh, about the frost penetration. And the other thing is the effect of excessive heat extraction on thermomechanical behavior of energy geostructures, and study that if we have uh, this excessive, how our foundation mechanically uh, will respond. Thank you so much. Great. Oh, thank you. So uh, my presentation today is looking at the state of geothermal research in Canada and largely from the federal perspective and looking at the history as well as where we are today. And most of uh, geothermal research on the federal level has been housed within the Geological Survey of Canada. So we're celebrating our 175th anniversary this year, which is why we have the, the retro logo. And there's engineers here, they're good at math, so you'll figure out we're 25 years older than Canada itself. So we like to think we did the geology so well they decided to make a country. 
And geothermal research in Canada really started in 1975 in response to the energy crisis. And, and this was similar to around the world, uh, where there was uh, governments around the world decided to invest in geothermal research as um, there's concern about access to sources of, of uh, petroleum-based energy at that time. If we look at the investment, it was uh, $10 million over 10 years that was spent, so about $46 million in today's money. And it was really the start of the first, first initial data gathering for geothermal capacity in Canada, establishment of lab capacities within governments and universities, and four major demonstration projects that were done. And the whole project was abruptly ended in 1985 when the price of oil collapsed and people no longer worried about a secure energy supply. And, uh, and at that time too, I mean, this, the funding came through the GSC, but kind of flowed out to support academic research projects as well. And there was also, a, there was a large community, there's a, a Geothermal Energy Association of Canada that existed at the time, and we had annual meetings and, and um, discussions like this. So there was a very active research community from that period, about 1975 to 85. Just a quick review of some of the work that was done. Um, there's a Mount Meagre research well. It was drilled at the Meagre volcano on BC, which is now steaming. So Canada does actually have a steaming volcano uh, uh, for the first time in a long time. And it was a success. It was the first geothermal electricity produced in Canada. They had a one megawatt plant producing waters at over 200 degrees Celsius. And uh, it just turned out that the flow was insufficient to make it economic to string the power lines into that site. So it's a tremendous geothermal resource there, but since at the time and, and since, uh, no one's figured out how to get enough flow to the system to make it an economic resource. Still probably one of the better potentials in the country. There's the Regina District Heating Well drilled on the University of uh, Regina campus. So kind of a fantasy here to see that sign there, geothermal test well. I mean, this is what we kind of dream about today, but this was done in the 70s. And you can see the Government of Canada logo on there as one of the funders for this project. It was a very successful drill project. The idea was to produce heat to um, direct heat a building that was going to be made on campus. The, the well was drilled, it was tested, it showed very high potential, but the building was never constructed. And now that well is under a parking lot on campus unfortunately, but it's, uh, it was a great uh, demonstration, a concept of the time. Uh, there was a work done on, on hot young intrusives in BC, so these are tertiary intrusive rocks that have high heat generating capacity, so high amounts of uranium, thorium, potassium. Um, a test well was drilled at the Coriol cyanate in southern BC. Like, these are just places you expect a lot of heat. And it was very positive. It showed a lot of heat potential on these sites, but just no permeability. And I think these guys at this time had a great idea, right? They go where the heat is, but they kind of missed the mark because they drilled into the granite that produces the heat rather than the sedimentary rocks beside it that you can get the hot waters out of. So they found a great heat resource, but just no, no permeability to make it work. And this was the most successful project of the time, uh, looking at abandoned mines and heat pump systems. And it was at Spring Hills, Nova Scotia, the, the uh, mine project. It's a great success, and it's still operating today. It's been running for about 40 years now as the, one of the greatest successes of ge geothermal in Canada, and really one of the prototypes in the world of this type of systems, where you have these huge volumes of warm water in abandoned mine shafts that you can extract the heat from and use for uh, district heating systems. Still operating today, they've expanded the system since the initial project uh, back in the 70s, and it's now being emulated in the uh, University Vancouver Island campus in Nanaimo, where they're developing uh, a similar uh, heat system for new campus buildings where they're using the abandoned coal mines underneath the campus to, to heat uh, buildings that are being constructed. So that's uh, the type of work that was done during that program, and then it kind of, it was all abruptly ended. And then there was about a 23-year hiatus until anything happened again, and that's where we had a renewed geothermal energy research program that went from about 2008 to 2012. Uh, this was driven now more by interest in grid diversification and at the time high petroleum prices and you know, talk of peak oil. 
uh, to look at alternative energy supplies. And one of the initial motivators for this too was that when that first program was canceled abruptly, there was, uh, you know, most of the data that was amalgamated was on paper and that got put into boxes and that got put into people's basements and garages who retired. And it was a, it was a project initially to capture and save and digitize this historic data. I mean, we put $46 million in today's dollars of, of tax money into gathering that data and it ended up in people's garages and it was at risk of being lost. So that's now all been digitized, uh, largely available publicly online. And then we use that to do the first uh, national resource assessment, because again, with the abrupt end of the previous program, there was no overall summary of what was learned. And, and people I would talk to uh, at the start of this would say there's no geothermal energy potential in Canada. And you know, I knew that was not true, but hard to make the argument unless you could actually demonstrate what was learned from the initial program phase. So we did this uh, big project, wrote a big report on the geothermal energy potential of the country, just to largely show that there was a great success from this earlier work, and we know that Canada has high resource potential. And again, like the previous program, this was all abruptly ended in, uh, in 2012, this, this program. But uh, you know, some of the things we did uh, work on was just showing like, where in the country you do have high uh, potential for geothermal energy for electrical generation, so some of the hot sedimentary basins in the country, the volcanic systems of Western Canada, the, the broad spectrum of uh, lower temperature uh, geothermal energy potential in Canada that could be used for district heating or other creative ways of heat use and then even looking at the potential for things like uh, for uh, heat exchange systems, which tends to, it gets limited in the north because once the ground gets frozen, you can't really use these shallow heat exchange systems so well, but you know, as Maurice has pointed out just now, the creative use of, of other ways uh, to use these deeper systems further north. And also just building on that success of the Spring Hill mines, you know, just assessing where are abandoned mines in Canada and wherever there's an abandoned mine, there's typically a small community that's lost its major industry. Um, in the case of Spring Hill in Nova Scotia, they were able to attract a plastics plant into town with a promise of cheap heat, which employs now 10% of the town's population. So it's a tremendous impact for a struggling community. This is an example of mines in BC, but they're throughout Canada. I also looked at the question of support for northern communities, um, which is a, a newer driver that there's energy supply for communities in the north um, that rely mostly on diesel for electricity and, and heat, and then the, all the challenges of just getting diesel into these communities, um, especially places where you know, things like ice roads start to get more limited through the year. And there's huge uh, subsidy costs for for um, bringing power to the north, and even then the average price is about 10 times the southern uh, energy costs. There's lots of uh, permafrost challenges uh, related to geothermal in northern communities, like some of the things we just heard, and it's just an example of a well log, the Malik Research Well in the Northwest Territories, and then you get to see that that dashed vertical line is the zero degree temperature mark. So in that case, you have to get down to about 800 meters just to get to zero. So depth becomes a big issue for northern communities. So where are we now? Uh, well, we're just at a resurgence once again to, uh, with the growing interest on in the federal level on geothermal research, uh, driven now by interest in reducing uh, Canada's carbon footprint and going to more clean uh, diversified energy grid. Uh, a lot of questions are being asked now of how can we provide geoscience to support regulatory development, help reduce exploration risk for companies, which is a big impediment, and then focus on high on grade areas uh, as, as well as support from uh, local and remote communities and, and looking at new technology. So these are just my own personal views at this time because we're just at the state of formulating a, a new program or, or new project ideas. And, and I would say that the higher potential areas are, are uh, of Western Canada these for electrical generations or Northern Canada where we can support uh, remote communities or areas that should have a initial uh, 
focus for research. There's a lot of barriers for geothermal development in Canada that go from policy to regulatory and, and um, a whole spectrum, but from the GSC point of view, we're looking at what geoscience uh, we can provide to support this, so what geoscience needs can, can we look at, and just the regional characterization of geothermal resources, understanding better crustal scale hydrogeology, how do you move fluids through the deep crust, hot sedimentary basin potential, the volcanic belt systems, micro-seismicity, EGS potential, and enhanced exploration methods. But I think from all of this, what we really need is a, is a successful development of a geothermal system to demonstrate the viability in Canada. So these earlier research programs, I mean, they just missed the mark, right? And, and we saw tremendous success in all of them, but they just were slightly off of a, of a true operating geothermal plant. And if we look at this kind of up and down history of how geothermal research has been funded, I mean, for the last 175 years, we've had a continual program on, on reducing exploration risk for the mineral, mineral industry. For probably 150 years, we had a coal research program until that was ended in the 1990s. And probably the last 100 years or so, we've been focused on, on petroleum research, right? So we have very long-term research programs that support different industries in Canada, and as of yet, we just don't have a, a fully running geothermal industry in the country where we have successful operating plants. So I think we really need some type of demonstration project that could show the viability of this and establish uh, continuity and, and hopefully a more long-term stable uh, research program as well. And I'll just use the last moments of my presentation to uh, flog the upcoming meeting in Vancouver next year, the resources for um, geoscience for generations in 2018. This is run by the International Union of Geological Sciences, the first one of its kind, so it's focusing on resources for uh, the future. And to my pleasure, there's four geothermal uh, programs that are being offered for, uh, and right now the app call for abstracts is just opened. Uh, I highlight the one in red, which is the most important, because that's the one I'm chairing. But I would just invite everyone to, to look into it, and uh, it'd be great to show a strong Canadian... What month? Oh, in June, sorry. <laughs> I missed the June. But it'd be uh, really fantastic, I think. This is it's an international meeting, but held in Vancouver, and it'd be a really great opportunity to show a strong Canadian presence that we are a very active geothermal research community. So I'd like everyone to consider presenting if they can. That's it, thank you. All right, thank you. It is a pleasure to be here today and uh, participate in a geothermal event happening actually in the east, eastern part of Canada. Uh, at INRS, we have recently been involved in uh, research for uh, geothermal heating uh, solutions for uh, northern regions, uh, experiencing Arctic to subarctic climate. Uh, so ground uh, permafrost conditions and uh, high heating loads for buildings representing more than 8,000 degree days for some uh, localities. In those remote areas, energy is mostly supplied by uh, fossil fuel, diesel, to uh, generate electricity and, uh, with, with generators and also to heat building with, uh, with diesel furnaces. Um, energy users or communities uh, for Nunavut and Nunavik, mostly Inuit communities, where 50% of the energy consumed is for space and water heating. 12% uh, will be for electricity and the remaining for transportation. And if you consider a subsidized diesel cost of about $1.5 per liter, heating a house would cost about 80 cents per kilowatt hours thermal. Uh, that's more than twice than what I pay for my house in Quebec but I know I have cheap access to cheap electricity. Um, mines. mines are important energy consumers in the north, um, and especially when uh, underground working has to be uh, heated. Uh, costs for heating at underground mines can represent 6 to 29 cents per ton extracted over, I don't know what cost, so 4 or $5 per, per ton extract. Um, and throughout my presentation, well, I'll give you a general background of, of what were the work we've been doing in, in Quebec, but also focus on a few specific areas, including the village of Kujuak, uh, Inuit communities, 
where uh, municipal water is distributed by truck, these yellow truck, uh, and uh, water that is pumped from a lake has to be heated with diesel uh, burners before being distributed to make sure it doesn't freeze. Uh, other um, case I will talk about is the uh, Eleonore mine uh, near the James Bay area uh, that heats its uh, underground workings with the uh, uh, propane uh, burners that you see in, in the, the, the picture there. Um, so there are some sustainable al alternative energy sources for the North to generate electricity mostly wind, solar, underwater hydro, has made huge steps and have started to move towards some demonstration projects in the high north. Uh, there is also some potential for high temperature geothermal, as Steve's shown with, with this, uh, the, this map. Uh, in, in the Northwest Territory, Yukon, where you have hot sedimentary aquifers, hot volcanics. Uh, but outside of those areas, um, low heat flow and what can be potentially developed or more low temperature geothermal energy uh, technology, as well as heat recovery and uh, burning of waste to generate uh, heat. In the area where, where we have been doing work, the, uh, the uh, Northern Territory of Quebec, north of the 49 parallel, uh, there are several mines, active mines showed in greens and uh, dozen of uh, Inuit communities uh, showed on, uh, on with whites. Heat flow tend to be fairly low. This is the Canadian Shield, uh, and we do not expect heat flow greater than 30, 40 milliwatt per, per square meters. So this would result in a geothermal gradient that are 10 to 20 uh, degrees Celsius per kilometers, and the depth to reach a temperature of 40 degrees Celsius uh, would be a threshold for direct use. Uh, geothermal application would be on the order of two kilometers to uh, maybe four kilometers, depending on the, the latitude and the uh, geological provinces. Um, rocks are Precambrian, okay, Grenville, Churchill uh, uh, province, uh, and also the uh, Superior uh, province which are um, old igneous and metamorphic rocks and some small sedimentary uh, basin, proterozoic sedimentary basins, um, that we tried to uh, estimate thermal conductivity based on the uh, rock type. Uh, thermal conductivity that can be low, insulating rocks, those um, yellow or pale brown colored, associated to sedimentary basin or an anorthosite complex that contains lots of uh, feldspar. Uh, where there could be potentially higher gradient and maybe uh, interest for deep, deep geothermal resources or high thermal conductivity, in this case, uh, maybe more interest into heat exchange uh, technology, which, which we believe could be viable all the way to, to uh, the north, even in those permafrost uh, conditions. Um, for the next slides, I'll talk about three different projects happening at uh, number one, the... Uh, the um, uh, Eleonore Mine, and then number two, uh, Kujuak, and three, uh, K uh, Kanji Swalujak, another Inuit village. At the Eleonore Mine, it's a, it's a gold corp mine, um, one of the recent mines where water is being pumped at high rate, more than uh, 300, well, about 300 cubic meters per hour, since the mine is located under a hydroelectric water reservoir. So there's lots of water infiltration in the mine, and we believe this water could be used uh, with geothermal heat pumps to produce heat and decrease the, uh, the energy demand to heat the underground working. The mine actually has access to cheap hydroelectricity, uh, but uh, still use propane to heat the underground working to decrease its, its uh, peak load. So how could that be implemented? Groundwater is pumped at a more or less uh, constant temperature throughout, throughout the year uh, compared to the air temperature. Uh, water could be sent to uh, heat exchangers. Um, uh, sorry for my diagram, it is in French. Uh, no time to translate this morning. Uh, but going in the plate heat exchangers, maybe from 12 to uh, 4 degrees Celsius, decrease the, uh, the, the, uh, the temperature, and uh, then transfer this heat to a, a second loop, 
that can operate well, all the way from zero to uh, eight, 10 degrees Celsius, and then transfer the heat again with other heat exchangers to the refrigerant. The refrigerant is being compressed to gain enough energy uh, and transfer this to the air that is sent on the ground. Uh, that would provide, we believe, uh, with, with rough calculation we have done, uh, energy uh, well, it could cover 31% of the heating needs and 24% uh, energy savings over a propane bill that is more than uh, 2.6 million per year and 30% uh, CO2 uh, reductions. Um, so on this project, this is a project happening now uh, with my research group. Uh, the idea is to develop a groundwater flow model to simulate uh, groundwater pumping and evaluate what could be this, this viability of this, uh, this exploitation for uh, the next 10, 20 years that the mine will be in operation. A uh, second project I want to mention uh, briefly is ter underground thermal energy storage for Kujuak uh, municipal water supply. So right now the water is taken uh, in Kujuak in uh, Stewart Lake at four degrees Celsius and is being heated with propane burners uh, to a temperature of seven degrees Celsius. So it's a low temperature application uh, to make sure it doesn't freeze when being distributed with those yellow trucks. Um, the energy consumption is about uh, 230 megawatt hours per, per, per year thermal. Uh, so we, at the cost of, well, here, $1.4 per liter, uh, we evaluated that it's uh, uh, $75,000 uh, uh, to eat the water of, of the town every year. What could be done? Uh, underground thermal energy storage system, so collecting heat during the summer mostly with, with solar panel, uh, have a solar plant that, uh, that has to be slightly oversized because there'll be heating loss, maybe some 500 megawatts, and uh, suppose there are 20% heat loss and then transfer this heat underground, again, with ground heat exchangers, so closed-loop geothermal technologies, uh, assuming here rough calculation with, again, 30% uh, heat loss. Uh, we could rise the, the ground temperature that is near a little bit above zero degrees Celsius. At its location, it's not frozen because it's near a lake. Uh, and uh, if we want to increase, well, temperature by about 20 kelvins, uh, to have a heat exchanger uh, plant. Uh, this would require about 10 by 10 boreholes, uh, 30 meter deep, um, uh, so 100 meters borehole, for a total cost of, uh, well, al almost half, half a million dollars. That could be uh, with a payback time of nine to 10 years, considering energy saving, to provide 100% renewable energy uh, to eat the municipal water. Uh, so this summer we started field work at Stewart Lake, uh, assembling the soil, measuring uh, hydraulic uh, properties, thermal properties, and doing geophysical survey. Uh, this is electrical resistivity profile done to evaluate uh, what could be subsurface material, fine, fine grain, uh, marine sediment, mostly fine sands, uh, underlain by glacial till and bedrock, those fine sands that contain lots of water, would be a, a good medium with a high heat capacity uh, that, that could be used to store uh, thermal energy. Uh, further research is going on to actually model this system and really demonstrate the economic viability on the uh, long term. A third project, which I'd like to, to show, is a ground coupled heat pump over permafrost in uh, the village of Kenji Swalujak in some very cold uh, environment. Uh, where, again, uh, the village is, is supplied by a local grid, so all energy there is diesel. Uh, we look at a research station that has pretty much the size of a, a small house uh, that is going to be constructed, and we believe that this house could be uh, heated with uh, ground carpet heat pumps, so closed-loop heat exchangers, at only two meters depth, there's no uh, drilling uh, capacity in this village, so trenches could be dig to install uh, slinky uh, ground heat exchangers in which there's a mix of water antifreeze that circulate and takes out the, the heat. Uh, and since there are no access to, well, clean electricity, uh, our, our idea was to look at absorption heat pumps, heat pumps that run on a, a fuel cycle uh, that is normally gas, but that could be replaced with, with diesel, and that will help sa save energy on the, uh, the long run. Uh, 
uh, based on the subsurface property, we evaluated a trench length of uh, 165 meters uh, for this house, simulating the, the energy loads that are shown in, in blue on, on my graph according to the outside air temperature, the, the black uh, line that goes all the way to minus 40 during the winter. Uh, so pretty tough climate. Uh, and then simulating the, uh, the, the, the ground heat exchangers operation based on uh, historic data of ground temperature that, that you show on the um, upper uh, left, left corner. Uh, this temperature is reproduced with analytical solutions. Try to estimate uh, with basic conductive heat transfer. We neglect here uh, the effect, uh, latent heat effect with freeze and thaw of the, the water in the soils. And um, with this background temperature, use analytical thermal response functions to anticipate what will be the operating temperature of the, the ground loops. Uh, so temperature is actually below zero degrees Celsius during winter, but uh, thermodynamically, it's still possible to extract heat. Uh, you have a, a working fluid below minus 10 degrees. It, it has to be entry freeze to work, of course, but you can still decrease its temperature and have a low COP uh, for your heat pump coefficient of performance for absorption heat pumps. That could be a COP of 1.2, 1.5, let's say. Uh, and compare these uh, scenarios for uh, heating the building with the conventional uh, fossil fuel furnace that would cost over a year roughly uh, $12,000. Um, and then if you have absorption heat pump, just air source heat pump, which I haven't really discussed, but could be an option, and the ground source heat pump, most interesting option to uh, realize energy savings on the order of... Uh, $4,700 per, per year, uh, roughly 40% of, of the, uh, the, the, the energy consumed. So something that could be implemented, I believe, in, in a short time frame to save uh, on diesel uh, and reduce energy consumptions. So those are just a few examples of projects we have been doing in the I North, but we're also looking at uh, several other areas with, with uh, my research group. For example, uh, groundwater heat pumps from flood and mine of the uh, Chape area. Uh, geothermal heat pumps for the village of Kujwax to heat buildings. Uh, we, 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 we did a mapping of thermal properties and now we want to simulate uh, ground carpet heat pumps operations in this permafrost environment and see how we can balance the loads maybe with, with producing thermal energy from solar panels and deep enhanced EGS system for Kujwak, uh, looking at local heat flow condition, uh, assessed from a uh, drilling hole in the Labrador trough, and also fracture network and simulation of EGS system. So this is what I believe are the low temperature geothermal heating options in the north, according to energy needs and energy availability. For large need, open loop systems are better suited because they have higher capacity but they tend to be more important on maintenance. So closed loop are better suited for smaller applications. Heat pump, when there are clean electricity, are viable options, especially heat pump with electric compressor. When there's no electricity, it goes to absorption cycle. And then, as a long-term goal, EGS system and underground thermal energy storage producing 100% renewable energy could be produced. Doing this research, we developed at INRS a new lab, a new core lab, uh, that we want to open, like, uh, run like an open source software and give a free space to do thermal and hydraulic pro property analysis of rocks. Uh, we just acquired an infrared scanner, guarded heat flow meter to do analysis from permafrost to geothermal reservoir condition and a transient parameter that can run, uh, do analysis at high pressure. I'd like to acknowledge all our um, all our collaborators from uh, university, uh, communities in the north, companies, funding agency, and maybe just give a last word for uh, UNESCO IGCP Group 636, which I'm a co-leader. Uh, this is a group that started in Colombia, in, in uh, South America, and whose objective is to try to tie a uh, south and northern uh, country and to work on the development of geothermal energy. All researchers interested in these topics are, are welcome to join. Thank you.